To Kill a Mockingbird, Chapter 12, page 153. Jem was twelve. He was difficult to live with, inconsistent, moody. His appetite was appalling, and he told me so many times to stop pestering him, I consulted Atticus. Reckon he's got a tapeworm? Atticus said no. Jem was growing. I must be patient with him and disturb him as little as possible. This change in Jem had come about in a matter of weeks. Mrs. DeBose was not cold in her grave. Jem had seemed grateful enough for my company when he went to read to her. Overnight, it seemed, Jem had acquired an alien set of values and was trying to impose them on me. Several times he went so far as to tell me what to do. After one altercation, when Jem hollered, It's time you start being a girl and acting right, I burst into tears and fled to Calpurnia. Don't you fret too much over Mr. Jem, she began. Mr. Jem? Yeah, he's just about Mr. Jem now. He ain't that old, I said. All I need is somebody to beat him up, and I ain't big enough. Baby, said Calpurnia. I just can't help it if Mr. Jem is growing up. He's going to want to be off to himself a lot now, doing whatever boys do. So you just come right on in the kitchen when you feel lonesome. We'll find lots of things to do in here. The beginning of that summer boded well. Jem could do as he pleased. Calpurnia would do until Dill came. She seemed glad to see me when I appeared in the kitchen. And by watching her, I began to think there was some skill involved in being a girl. But summer came, and Dill was not there. I received a letter and a snapshot from him. The letter said he had a new father, his picture was enclosed, and he would have to stay in Meridian because they planned to build a fishing boat. His father was a lawyer like Atticus, only much younger. Dill's new father had a pleasant face, which made me glad Dill had captured him. But I was crushed. Dill concluded by saying he would love me forever and not to worry. He'd come get me and marry me as soon as he got enough money together, so please write. The fact that I had a permanent fiancé was little compensation for his absence. I had never thought about it, but summer was dill by the fish pool, smoke and string, dill's eyes alive with complicated plans to make Boo Radley emerge. Summer was the swiftness with which dill would reach up and kiss me when Jem was not looking, the longings we sometimes felt each other feel. With him, life was routine. Without him, life was unbearable. I stayed miserable for two days. As if that were not enough, state legislature was called into emergency session, and Atticus left us for two weeks. The governor was eager to scrape a few barnacles off the ship estate. There were sit-down strikes in Birmingham. Bread lines in the cities grew longer. People in the country grew poorer. But these were events remote from the world of Jem and me. We were surprised one morning to see a cartoon in the Montgomery Advertiser above the caption, Make em's Finch. It showed Atticus barefooted and in short pants, chained to a desk. He was diligently writing on a slate while some frivolous-looking girls yelled, Yoo-hoo! at him. That's a compliment, explained Jem. He spends his time doing things that wouldn't get done if nobody did him. Huh? In addition to Jem's newly developed characteristics, he had acquired a maddening air of wisdom. Ah, Scout, it's like reorganizing the tax system of the counties and things. That kind of thing's pretty dry to most men. How do you know? Ah, go on and leave me alone. I'm reading the paper. Jem got his wish. I departed for the kitchen. While she was shelling peas, Calpurnia suddenly said, What am I going to do with y'all's church this Sunday? Nothing, I reckon. Atticus left us collection. Calpurnia's eyes narrowed, and I could tell you what was going through her mind. Cal, I said, you know we'll behave. We haven't done anything in church in years. Calpurnia, evidently, remembered a rainy Sunday when we were both fatherless and teacherless. Left to its own devices, the class tied Eunice Ann Simpson to a chair and placed her in the furnace room. We forgot her trooped upstairs to church, and were listening quietly to the sermon when a dreadful banging issued from the radiator pipes, persisting until someone investigated and brought forth Eunice Ann, saying she didn't want to play Shadrach anymore. Jem Finch said she wouldn't get burnt if she had enough faith, but it was hot down there. Besides, Cal, this isn't the first time Atticus has left us, I protested. Yeah, but he makes certain your teacher's going to be there. I didn't hear him say this time. Reckon he forgot it. Calpurnia scratched her head. Suddenly she smiled. How'd you and Mr. Jem like to come to church with me tomorrow? Really? How bad it, grinned Calpurnia. If Calpurnia had ever bathed me roughly before, it was nothing compared to her supervision of that Saturday night's routine. She made me soap all over twice, drew fresh water in the tub for each rinse. She stuck my head in the basin and washed it with octagon soap and cast dial. She had trusted Jem for years, but that night she invaded his privacy and provoked an outburst. Can't anybody take a bath in this house without the whole family looking? The next morning, she began earlier than usual to go over our clothes. When Calpurnia stayed overnight with us, she slept on a folding cot in the kitchen. That morning, it was covered with our Sunday habiliments. 
She had put so much starch in my dress, it came up like a tent when I sat down. She made me wear a petticoat, and she wrapped a pink sash tightly around my waist. She went over my patent leather shoes with a cold biscuit until she saw her face in them. It's like we're going to Mardi Gras, said Jen. What's all this for, Cal? I don't want anybody saying I don't look after my children, she muttered. Mr. Jim, you absolutely can't wear that tie with that suit. It's green. What's the matter with that? Suit's blue. Can't you tell? Hee <laughs> hee. I howled. Jim's colorblind. His face flushed angrily, but Calpurnia said, Now y'all quit that. You're going to go to first purchase with smiles on your face. First purchase African M.E. Church was in the quarters outside the southern town limits, across the old sawmill tracks. It was an ancient, paint-peeled frame building, the only church in Maycomb with a steeple and bell, called First Purchase because it was paid for from the first earnings of freed slaves. Negroes worshipped in it on Sundays, and white men gambled in it on weekdays. The churchyard was brick-hard clay, as was the cemetery beside it. Someone died during a dry spell. The body was covered with chunks of ice until rain softened the earth. A few graves in the cemetery were marked with crumbling tombstones. Newer ones were outlined with brightly colored glass and broken Coca-Cola bottles. Lightning rods guarding some graves denoted dead who rested uneasily. Stumps of burned-out candles stood on the head of infant graves. It was a happy cemetery. The warm, bittersweet smell of the clean Negro welcomed us as we entered the churchyard. Hearts of love, hairdressing mingled with asafoetida, snuff, Hoyt's cologne, Brown's mule, peppermint, and lilac talcum. When they saw Jem and me with Calpurnia, the men stepped back and took off their hats. The women crossed their arms at their waists, weekday gestures of respectful attention. They parted and made a small pathway to the church door for us. Calpurnia walked between Jem and me, responding to the greetings of her brightly clad neighbors. "'What you up to, Miss Cal?' said a voice behind us. Calpurnia's hands went to our shoulders, and we stopped and looked around. Standing in the path behind us was a tall Negro woman. Her weight was on one leg. She rested her left elbow on the curve of her hip, pointing at us with the upturned palm. She was bullet-headed with strange almond-shaped eyes, straight nose, and an Indian bow mouth. She seemed seven feet high. I felt Calpurnia's hand dig into my shoulder. "'What you want, Lula?' she asked in tones I had never heard her use. She spoke quietly, contemptuously. "'I want to know why you bring in white chillin' to the nigger church.' "'They's my company,' said Calpurnia. Again I thought her voice strange. She was talking like the rest of them. "'Yeah, I reckon you's company at the Finch's house during the week,' a murmur ran through the crowd. "'Don't you fret,' Calpurnia whispered to me, but the roses on her hat trembled indignantly. When Lula came up the pathway toward us, Calpurnia said, "'Stop right there, nigger.' Lula stopped, but she said, "'You ain't got no business bringing white chillin' here. "'They got their church, we got ourn. "'It's our church, ain't it, Miss Cal?' Calpurnia said, "'It's the same God, ain't it?' Jem said, "'Let's go home, Cal. "'They don't want us here.' I agreed. They did not want us here. I sensed, rather than saw, that we were being advanced upon. They seemed to be drawing closer to us, but when I looked up at Calpurnia, there was amusement in her eyes. When I looked down the pathway again, Lula was gone. In her place was a solid mass of colored people. One of them stopped from the crowd. It was Zebo, the garbage collector. Mr. Jem, he said, we're mighty glad to have you all here. Don't pay no attention to Lula. She's contentious because Reverend Sykes threatened to church her. She's a troublemaker from way back. Got fancy ideas and haughty ways. We're mighty glad to have you all. With that, Calpurnia led us to the church door where we were greeted by Reverend Sykes, who led us to the front pew. First purchase was unsealed and unpainted within. Along its walls, unlighted kerosene lamps hung on brass brackets. Pine benches served as pews. Behind the rough oak pulpit, a faded silk banner proclaimed, God is love, the church's only decoration except a rotogravure print of Hunt's The Light of the World. There was no sign of piano, organ, hymn books, church programs, the familiar ecclesiastical impedimenta we saw every Sunday. It was dim inside with a damp coolness slowly dispelled by the gathering congregation. At each seat was a cheap cardboard fan bearing a garish garden of Gethesemon, courtesy Tyndall's Hardware Co. You name it, we sell it. Calpurnia motioned Jem and me to the end of the row and placed herself between us. She fished in her purse, drowned her handkerchief, and untied the hard wad of change in its corner. She gave a dime to me and a dime to Jem. We've got ours, he whispered. 
You keep it, Calpurnia said. You are my company. Jem's face showed brief indecision on the ethics of withholding his own dime, but his innate courtesy won, and he shifted his dime to his pocket. I did likewise, with no qualms. Cal, I whispered, where are the hymn books? We don't have any, she said. Well, how? Shh, she said. Reverend Sykes was standing behind the pulpit, staring the congregation silent. He was a short, stocky man in a black suit, black tie, white shirt, and a gold watch chain that glinted in the light from the frosted windows. He said, Brethren and sisters, we are particularly glad to have company with us this morning, Mr. and Miss Finch. You all know their father. Before I begin, I will read some announcements. Reverend Sykes shuffled some papers, chose one, and held it at arm's length. The Missionary Society meets in the home of Sister Annette Reeves next Tuesday. Bring your sewing. He read from another paper. You all know of Brother Tom Robinson's trouble. He has been a faithful member of First Purchase since he was a boy. The collection taken up today and for the next three Sundays will go to Helen, his wife, to help her out at home. I punched Jem. That's Tom Atticus's to... Shh. I turned to Calpurnia but was hushed before I opened my mouth. Subdued, I fixed my attention upon Reverend Sykes, who seemed to be waiting for me to settle down. Will the music superintendent lead us in the first hymn, he said. Zebo rose from his pew and walked down the center aisle, stopping in front of us and facing the congregation. He was carrying a battered hymn book. He opened it and said, We'll sing number 273. <clears throat> this was too much for me. How are we going to sing it if there aren't any hymn books? Calpurnia smiled. Hush, baby, she whispered. You'll see in a minute. Zebo cleared his throat and read in a voice like the rumble of distant artillery. There's a land beyond the river. Miraculously, on pitch, a hundred voices sang out Zebo's words. The last syllable, held to a husky hum, was followed by Zebo saying, That we call the sweet forever. Music again swelled around us, and the last note lingered, and Zebo met it with the next line. And we only reached that shore by faith's decree. The congregation hesitated. Zebo repeated the line carefully, and it was sung. At the chorus, Zebo closed the book, a signal for the congregation to proceed without his help. On the dying notes of Jubilee, Zebo said, In that far-off sweet forever, just beyond the shining river. Line for line, voices followed in simple harmony until the hymn, book, hymn ended in a melancholy murmur. I looked at Jem, who was looking at Zebo from the corner of his eyes. I didn't believe it either. But we'd both heard it. Reverend Sykes then called on the Lord to bless the sick and the suffering, a procedure no different from our church practice, except Reverend Sykes directed the deity's attention to several specific cases. His sermon was a forthright denunciation of sin and austere declaration of the motto on the wall behind him. He warned his flock against the evils of heady brews, gambling, and strange women. Bootleggers caused enough trouble in the quarters, but women were worse. Again, as I had often met in my own church, I was confronted with the impurity of women doctrine that seemed to preoccupy all clergymen. Jim and I heard the same sermon Sunday after Sunday, with only one exception. Reverend Sykes used his pulpit more freely to express his views on individual lapses from grace. Jim Hardy had been absent from church for five Sundays, and he wasn't sick. Constance Jackson had better watch her ways. She was in grave danger for quarreling with her neighbors. She had erected the only spite fence in the history of the quarters. Reverend Sykes closed his sermon. He stood beside a table in front of his pulpit, requesting the morning offering, a proceeding that was strange to Jem and me. One by one, the congregation came forward and dropped nickels and dimes into a black enameled coffee can. Jem and I followed suit and received a soft, thank you, thank you, as our dimes clinked. To our amazement, Reverend Sykes emptied the can onto the table and raked the coins into his hands. He straightened up and said, this is not enough. We must have ten dollars. The congregation stirred. You all know what it's for. Helen can't leave those children to work while Tom's in jail. If everybody gives one more dime, we'll have it. Reverend Sykes waved his hand and called to someone in the back of the church. Alec, shut the doors. Nobody leaves here until we have ten dollars. Calpurnia scratched in her handbag and brought forth a battered leather coin purse. Nah, Cal, Jim whispered when she handed him a shiny quarter. We can put ours in. Give me your dime, Scout. The church was becoming stuffy, and it occurred to me that Reverend Sykes intended to sweat the amount due to, out of his flock. Fans crackled. Feet shuffled. Tobacco chewers were in agony. I'm going to pause here almost out of time. Continue on with the next video, please.